It's not long now before we'll all have to vote in a referendum. The question, do we support adding an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Australia's constitution? In one sense, our task is simple, deciding between yes and no. But the debate has been messy and it's left a lot of people confused. At TDA, we want to cut through the noise. In three short episodes, I'll lay out all the facts you need, give you the yes and no perspectives straight from the source, and show you a range of First Nations perspectives to tell you what they think. I'm Tom Crowley reporting on Yawaru Country and this is Understanding the Voice. In the first episode, where did the voice come from? There are plenty of places that we could start this story, but let's go right back. For at least 60,000 years, these lands have been home to a collection of distinct cultural and language groups called the First Nations. About 250 years ago, British colonisers arrived, and in the years that followed, it's estimated that as much as 90% of the pre-colonisation First Nations population was wiped out. In 1901, Australia's founding document, the Constitution, specifically excluded First Nations people from policy making something which continued until 1967. Today, disparities persist. The life expectancy for a First Nations person is eight years less than for a non-First Nations Australian. A First Nations woman is significantly more likely to die in childbirth, and a young First Nations man is more likely to go to prison than to university. And despite government efforts to close that gap, it has remained, and in many cases, it's gotten worse. This is something that just about everybody in the voice debate agrees needs to change. We need to see better outcomes on the ground. You know, this is a matter of life or death. There are people in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community who are living in dreadful situations. You, you cannot ignore that. Here we are in the 21st century and, uh, and, and I'm seeing things that, that I saw when I was a kid 50 years ago. Yeah. Over 50% of the communities in remote Australia do not have drinkable water. And most Indigenous people living in remote and rural Australia can no longer afford to feed their families and haven't been able to for a long time. Something else that people in this debate seem to agree on is that First Nations people are best placed to offer the solutions to these problems. It's not a new idea either. In 1938, Yorta Yorta man William Cooper sent a petition to the King asking for Aboriginal representation in Australia's parliament. He argued it would get better outcomes. Since that time, a number of different bodies have been set up to involve First Nations people in First Nations policies, but all of them have since been abolished. For advocates of a voice, the lesson from all of this is simple. Consultation works, but it's governments who keep getting in the way. Governments in the past have played a lot of games with Indigenous people. We talk about political football, and we've seen that in representative bodies being stood up and then abolished and stood up by the next government and abolished by the next government. We need the security. A budget can roll on from year to year, funding completely the wrong intervention that, you know, is not getting any outcomes, any successful outcomes, simply because the executive government are wedded to a policy position that's dictated by a minister. And that is the primary reason why we're not closing the gap. This frustration was front of mind for First Nations leaders when they gathered in 2017 to talk about a different question, constitutional recognition. For years, there had been a push to add symbolic language to our nation's constitution, to recognise First Nations people as the original inhabitants. It was an idea with broad political support. The recognition part is very important because we believe that it will give Indigenous people dignity in the Australian nation. Having status in the constitution will mean that we're part of the national fabric, finally. Under Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, a council was set up to work towards a referendum on recognition. The council held meetings across the country, but a consistent theme emerged. First Nations people didn't want symbolism. They wanted something practical. The constitutional conversations ended with a convention at Uluru. 250 First Nations leaders selected from across the country agreed on a statement, which came to be known as the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The number one element was a constitutionally enshrined voice. Now, not everybody was on board. Polls show the large majority, more than 80% of First Nations people support a voice, but there was bound to be some disagreement. 
Lydia Thorpe was part of a group of progressive First Nations people who didn't like the idea of putting an advisory body into the same constitution that had been written by the colonial powers. This country, your system of government, has been built on lies. And the referendum for the voice to parliament is a continuation of these lies. The voice is the easy way to fake progress without actually having to change a thing. Our people have never ceded sovereignty. We have never given up our right to manage our own lands and our own people. That is our constitution. We've got the oldest constitution on the planet. Yours has only been here a couple of hundred years. But there were also concerns among First Nations people on the other end of politics. Yungai Warren Mundine had supported constitutional recognition, but he didn't like the idea of a voice, which he didn't believe would be any different from things which had been tried before. That was one of the reasons I left was because, to me, it was like a huge bureaucracy was going to be set up. It's a committee, a group of people, who are going to advise government, and, and government doesn't have to accept that advice, or it can accept that advice. That, to me, seems a bit weird because we've been doing this for 50 years. Since the 70s, we've been uh, having advisory committees who governments accept their advice or don't accept their advice. So I don't see the point in putting that in the Constitution. Mundine's argument goes deeper than just whether the voice will work. At the press club during the campaign, he cast the referendum as divisive. That's what the referendum and this Uluru statement is all about. A radical and divisive vision of Australia. Marcia Langton says division is already a reality. Is there anybody else in Australian society that is constantly told, cease to exist, cease to exist, we don't have to recognise you, stop speaking your language, don't cook your food? It only applies to us. As Aboriginals, we have a choice. Continue to feel aggrieved or to draw a line in history and not be captive to that past. Well, that's not how the world works. If you grow up a certain way in a family that's Indigenous, you are who you are. If you live in a society that doesn't accept who you are, then you will constantly run into problems. The Uluru Statement sees Indigenous Australians as trapped in victimhood and oppression. These arguments against a voice were expressed at the time, but they weren't the majority view among First Nations people. Lydia Thorpe was part of a group of seven who walked out of Uluru in protest, but the remaining 243 called for a voice to be enshrined in Australia's constitution. But an idea that was born at Uluru would next have to go through Canberra, and that's where things would get a little messy. In the next episode, I'll take a look at the politics.